I have a project called Finding Patterns. And Finding Patterns aims to reveal aspects of nature that are normally hidden from the view of everyday life. I use all sorts of ways to express these ideas, painting, prose, film, even sometimes inventing and building things like a sunshine-powered cinema. Today, inspired by the theme of brightness, I'd like to open our minds to the world of light, share how nature chooses to be bright, and ask what we might learn for life. The world of light is far greater than the eye perceives. In this darkened space, you might imagine it to be relatively empty of light. The contrary is true. The room is full of light. There's obviously the lights over there and the projector bulb, and you can see the light scattering off the screen, coming off dust motes around the room and scattering off some of the atoms and molecules that make up the blue hues of the walls. If I was to turn on a radio, we'd hear voices and music from around the world. Radio waves, too, are light. The only difference between them and the light that we see with our eyes is the size of the waves. Radio waves are the size of buildings, from sheds to skyscrapers, from a meter to several hundred meters. Whereas the visible light that we see with our eyes, well, that's very small. That's around one thousandth of the breadth of a human hair. So because we don't see these radio waves with our eyes, we use the electronic circuitry of radio to detect them. And we can use our imaginations for a moment to see radio waves zooming across this room in all directions coming from transmitters around the globe and in space, bringing news and information. Also, in this room, is light from the early universe. This light is 14,000 million years old, and we are all touching it, always. When the universe was very young, it was much smaller, much simpler, a hot, dense soup of charged matter and light. And the light was scattered ceaselessly off the charged matter, like in a cloud or in the foam at the sea's edge. As space expanded, things became less dense, and the light was set free to travel, and has been traveling ever since to reach us here as microwave light, light of around one millimeter in wavelength. It is the oldest and the most predominant light in the universe, making up over 95% of all of the total light energy. And you've detected it. It's about half a percent of the crackle on your radio. And when we look carefully at this light using special detectors, it reveals to us the early structures of the universe. And those structures are the beginnings of the galaxies we see today. What other light is in this dim room? There's the radiated heat from our bodies. This is infrared light. And it's around a needle point in wavelength, and we sense it on our skin. If we had different eyes, we'd have different powers and different perceptions. We'd see the internal structure of things, <coughs> the friction of a fountain as it falls on water, and the glow of life. And I can continue on along through the spectrum of light, the visible light that I've spoken about, beyond our even shorter wavelengths of ultraviolet X and gamma rays. And they contribute less to the light in the room because they're produced in our sun and in outer space and absorbed by various different ways before reaching us here. But we can envision this space to be 
dancing with light waves, coming from all directions and of wildly varying sizes. Tiny waves of light coming from the lamps over there, vast waves of radio washing in from the continents, the ancient glow of the early universe and the radiant heat of our bodies. We are in a room that is quite bright with light, yet only some small part, the visible part we're able to see with our eyes, is made apparent to us. Brightness takes imagination and creativity to find. It's natural to ask, how is all of this light created? Light has its origins in the changing motion of charged matter, charged electrical matter. Everything, all atoms, are made of positive and negative pieces of matter. And you might have experienced these pieces of charge as a child when you rubbed a balloon and your hair stood on end, or you put your tongue across the end of a battery and you felt a small tingle. Light is created when these charges accelerate. And the motion of charge and the creation of light go hand in hand. Light makes charges move, and moving charges make light. Much of the colour that we see in the world, the hue of our skin, the rosy peel of an apple, and the vivid pigments of a painting is owed to the motion of charge inside the atom. Matisse said, a painting must possess a real power to generate light, and that he was conscious of expressing himself in light. He was right, when he selected his gorgeous pigments, he was choosing atoms and molecules that would choose the colour of light for him. It's a lovely process to think about and can be discovered by entering the atom. And when we enter, we find we can think of every atom as a tiny musical instrument, each element having a very particular set of notes. And we can describe them as concentric circles. This is a hydrogen atom. Hydrogen is the simplest and the most abundant element in the world, in the universe. And here are its notes shown accurately, exactly as we measure them to be. The lowest frequency note is the outer ring, and the higher notes are the smaller rings in the centre. And we've converted these, the first 11 notes, into sound, so you can hear. In reality, they are not sound, they are light, and the visible light notes hydrogen absorbs and emits are these. Remarkably, whenever we look into space and we see these colour notes, we know they have come from hydrogen. And we can explore all atoms and molecules in this way. This is oxygen. The lowest frequency note is the outer ring, and the descant frequencies are in the centre. And this is oxygen's visible song. The light notes that oxygen absorbs and emits are these. Nature's musicality is vividly revealed in this spectrum of sunlight. The absent notes are the decisive selections made by atoms and molecules on sunlight's journey to Earth. Each atom extracts only those particular notes corresponding with its song and drinks up the energy. And back on Earth, the greenness of leaves and stems is owed to chlorophyll molecules choosing red and blue light to power the plant, leaving, for photosynthesis, leaving a world of green. 
This important selection process where atoms wholly absorb or brightly emit particular light notes is called resonance. Most light waves will do nothing to the atom. They will be either too long or too short to be of any interest. But when the light wave is just right, the atom dances excitedly and soars to an extraordinary peak. Everyone knows what resonance is in life. When you bump into an old friend, find a poem where the form brilliantly echoes the idea, or spend the perfect day. We are filled with a great sense of delight, enrichment, and well-being. And we can all go through life, and not much happens when we are here or when we are here. But when resonance occurs, there is this fantastic transfer of energy. Things start to dance, and even the smallest amounts of the right energies can bring magnificent results. Resonance pops up again and again in nature, and is essential to the world of music where the geometry of the, of the instrument, the size and shape of the bell, the length of the string, determines the resonant notes. A vivid musical example can be given by scattering dust over a flat metal plate and vibrating it at different frequencies. At just the right frequencies, beautiful patterns emerge. In 1809, Napoleon and his court were fans of these demonstrations and they hosted their discoverer Ernst Chladny and his sound figures. And 100 years later, in the early 20th century, with the advent of quantum mechanics, we discovered similar formations inside the atom. Here are some formations for a particular note of a hydrogen atom. The formation of the atom depends on the resonant note that it plays. Napoleon could never have imagined that those dusty figures he found so mesmerizing might also occur in the heart of the atom, bringing color to the world. <coughs> Resonance is when you find the note that something naturally sings. It is the exhilarating point at which energy flows easily in and easily out. Nature cannot resist a resonant note. These two connected pendulums talk like this because they share the same length and therefore the same frequency. They will not dance like this for any other beat. Nature's urge to dance brilliantly to particular beats, which is so essential to our world of music, colour and motion, leads me to close by asking if there is something we might learn for, for living. From an artist's point of view, and for all of us who wish to communicate, I think this resonant point is the one we seek. The connection between the image and idea, the poem and the impulse, the music and the feeling, the dancer and the beat. Resonant works are the ones that dance while the others sleep. And for all of us in life, we each have our own set of natural notes. And I wonder if an important part of life, of the art of life, is to courageously search for our unique resonances, carefully and imaginatively finding the things that drive and excite us so that we, in turn, are bright. Thank you.